Hi, my name is Aida Garrido. I am presenting on a computer program I wrote while working for the archives at New York Public Radio, where I was an intern this past calendar year. I'm currently based in New York City, um, and I am the archives assistant at Dia Art Foundation. I have a background in history, time-based art, and analog film. However, in the past year, I've been focusing on digital preservation. The, this code I developed for NYPR optimizes their post-digitization workflow and reduces the time spent on QCing the work of their vendor by automating the analysis of audio reference sine wave tones. Uh, before I go further, I want to thank the staff at New York Public Radio, Mark, uh, Margos Ball, Ben Houtman, Andy Lancet, and Danny Spardella. I also want to thank Dave Rice and Paul Mahol for their email correspondence. Um, the motivation for this code is to assess the quality of digital transfers at scale. New York Public Radio is now undertaking a massive preservation project funded by a $2.5 million grant from the Leon Levy Foundation. The goal is to digitize 45,000 assets by 2024. These assets primarily comprise collections of open reel tapes and they are sent to a vendor off-site for digitization. The problem is that this is an overwhelming amount of material for a department of four people. But because these are broadcast files, a majority of the assets start with an audio reference level that is used by the vendor to calibrate their equipment. But even with limiting the quality control to these parts of the files, generally the first few minutes of a one hour broadcast, the work remains slow. NYPR has been using ASTAT audit to generate graphic reports like this one, which summarize audio metrics from FFmpeg. If you zoom into the image, uh, you can see that in this example file, the tone at head is well correlated and at negative 18 dBFS in both channels. The issue is that analyzing an image like this one for every sound file is a time and labor intensive task, although it is certainly an improvement from loading waves into Adobe Audition and searching for problems that way. ASTAT audit does generate a CSV for a directory of files, but it cannot identify sine wave tones and report on each one discreetly. This means that the reported values reflect the whole file and are not as reliable or helpful as the granularity achieved in this image or in my code. In summary, um, we have a directory of sound files that begin with audio reference sine wave tones. In the waveform, the tone is easily identified as a rectangular block, as you see there. We want to know the frequency of the tone, um, its peak and RMS amplitude, and phase shift. This will give us a first order understanding of the digital transfer's quality. And we want, all the, and we want these values in a CSV for all files in a directory. So the goal or the desire is to have a concise report shortly after digitization indicating which digital files require immediate and closer attention. Um, and I wrote a robust prototype using Python code that essentially does just this. The code is three classes, 600 lines in length. It utilizes the Python libraries NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Excel Writer. The core of my code is my methodology for detecting a tone. I define a sine wave tone as a signal with stable volume and frequency over a period of time. I offer this, as, this definition as a framework because the code allows for some user input and flexibility. The first user input um, is sensitivity, which establishes the threshold for volume and frequency fluctuation. This decimal number is just a percentage, so the smaller the number, the more adverse the analysis will be to fluctuations, and the larger the number, the more forgiving it is of fluctuations. It's important that I coded this feature because we are not working with perfect digital tones, but tones on tapes with some degrees of noise uh, rendered digitally. Um, the analysis itself is discretized over a fixed number of samples, so it compares the frequency and volume of one set of samples to the next one, and so on. The script is programmed to disregard silences, which is technically a signal with stable frequency and volume. Um, yeah. Um, and 
The next user input is tone length. You could imagine that there are sounds which are neither silence nor tones, but have stable frequency and volume. For example, sustained note on an instrument. The larger the number, the less likely it is uh, you'll pick up these incidental sounds. This isn't an ideal metric, um, and I'll speak more on that later. The third user input is analysis length, which is, which is optional to specify. This is for the sake of saving processing time. If you intuit that it's unnecessary for the code to process past a certain point in a signal, you can specify that. For example, in a collection of hour-long broadcasts, it's probably not necessary to analyze past the five minutes of that file. Um, and the fourth user input, the last one, is whether you want to plot the tone detection. I'll show you examples of these plots. These are just visual aids, visual aids which I have been using to assess the efficacy of my code. So this is more of a testing feature, um, and I'd, it's probably not necessary to include it once I refine the code. Um, and in brief, just the methodologies for determining the values themselves, because I had to do so much signal processing to get to the point of tone detection, it was trivial for me to just calculate this instead of making an external call to FFmpeg. Um, so for frequency, um, I decompose a time domain signal into its spectral components using fast Fourier transform, and then I find the index of the peak magnitude in the complex valued array. Um, this is basic physics, but uh, those are the formulas I use uh, once I establish for RMS and peak, once I establish the boundaries of a tone, I normalize the sample values and um, use those formulas. And with phase shift, this is relevant uh, to, to only two channel files. Um, I compute that by comparing the two signals and calculating the cross correlation, the index of the maximum cross correlation, um, time lag, and the phase shift in radians. I normalize that by pi to get a value between negative one to one, because that's what Adobe Addition shows, and that's the values that the NYPR team are accustomed to reading. Um, and so here's an example of a successful tone detection. This is what the plots look like, um, and the yellow bars indicate where my code detected the boundaries of, of a tone. And these are the values my code produced compared to the values you would get from Adobe Edition. As you can see, they're um, essentially the same. Here's another tone detection that was performed on a more complex file. The code identified every component of this tone run. So all the um, rectangles you see. Um, and I just wanted to point, oh, there's a little video here, but uh, that's fine. Um, just wanted to focus on the phase shift in this particular example. It's a bit hairy comparing a static value to the phase meter because um, uh, an anti-correlated phase relationship tends to be represented with a lot of movement in the meter. But um, generally it tracks well and the numbers I get uh, do reflect the general extent to which a signal is out of phase. And this is the formal output you get with my code. So this is a test I did with a directory of 10 files. You get the Excel sheet, um, a folder of plot figures, and below is a snapshot of the Excel sheet itself. You have the tone timestamp, the audio values. In the case of a single channel audio, you don't see um, values represented for the second channel. If a file has no tones, it's still printed, but all the columns to the right of the file name are left blank. So I want to discuss accuracy. I will say the tone detection has been like 95% accurate, 98. Um, I've tested this over hundreds of files, and the screenshot you see here has been the only instance of a false positive. I've never had a false negative. As I said, the code is a prototype. I was in the middle of working on it as my internship ended, and I have ideas of how to improve it and to avoid false detections like this one. As I said, I don't think tone length as an input or criteria is ideal. You should be able to detect a sine wave tone regardless of its length without detecting other incidental sounds. Other criteria to consider include harmonics, timbre, and the general complexity of the spectral components. Um, I'm personally interested in using a function in SciPy which measures the spectral entropy of a signal. 
Um, another area of improvement is to avoid excessive splintering, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So here are a few um, uh, plots from the 10 example files from the previous screenshot, and as you can see, I get um, pretty good results. Uh, and you can see how that this tone detection managed to avoid that uh, long instance of silence. Looks pretty good. And then you see there, there's an issue right there. Um, what occasionally happens is that sometimes there's an aberrant group of samples within the same tone, and the code treats the signal following those aberrant group of samples as the start of a new tone. And can, you can see that a bit more clearly here. Um, I, I know how to fix this, I just I haven't had time. Um, so that's something I'd like to do. Um, I'd also like to improve runtime and memory. I've, I have an idea of how to do this. The runtime depends on how big your files are, the length of analysis, and whether you want the tone detection to, plot, to be plotted. So uh, the previous example where there's a directory of 10 files, 10 gigabytes total, including plotting, the code took about five minutes to run. I've also successfully run this code on a directory of 200 audio files, and that took about an hour, 90 minutes. And I will say the plotting takes a very long time because it's data dense. It's 48,000 samples per second. And if you don't do the plots, that cuts the runtime in half. Um, other improvements, because I'm being super DIY, um, with my spectral analysis not using FFmpeg, I'm realizing I should be using windowing techniques. Um, I want to get this to work on Mac and PC. Um, I developed this on PC, and I have a Mac at home, and I made some minor edits, and it can run on Mac as well. And also, I want to, in to integrate some color coding um, for the anom for color coding on the Excel sheet for anom anomalous values based on user input. So for example, NYPR, uh, consulted with his engineers to establish an alignment level of ne negative 18 dBFS and several ranges of tolerance based on frequency. So anticipating some criticism, I want to address these two questions. Are tones on tape reliable? So the reference tones on the recordings in NYPR's collection were laid down by professional engineers. NY NYPR has asked the digitization vendor to calibrate their playback decks to these tones. Should it be discovered that when reviewing the files that the tones were in fact unreliable and we, NYPR would pay for a second take? But throughout the course of this project, NYPR has never had to pay for a single retake because of unreliable tones. Um, and the second question, doesn't anyone bother listening to the files? Uh, of course, but the point of this is to surface potential problems and to make a final determination after listening and to address these potential problems as promptly as possible. And briefly, I want to consider future direc directions. So I can imagine detecting noise tones, which are also used in audio. Uh, and in the visual realm, maybe you can, use, you can use a similar or a modified approach to detect bars and automating data extraction for that as well. And lastly, I'm very self-aware that this pre presentation has been super technical. I want to <laughs> direct you all to the wonderful WNYC archive page where you can explore the collection. And to the previous question of do you actually listen to this stuff, I want to highlight one of my favorite discoveries. I learned that Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone was an unpaid intern at WNYC in the 1950s and he scripted a show called Toward a Better Society. The premise of the show is to dramatize incidents of real crime in New York City, and then to invite a panel of real psychologists to analyze the situation. And there's a specific episode about a guy who embezzles stamps from his job so he can afford dates with his girlfriend. Um, anyway, okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's take one question before moving on to our last presentation. Oh, yeah.
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question. Is there some danger that you um, calibrated your software that it, only co that it not only copies the feature but also the bugs of the Adobe software? What are the bugs of the Adobe well, software? Um, what I mean is, is it possible that, that you, you optimized your program so long until it works exactly like the Adobe program, but instead of like finding another more objective um, bar that, that you should pass? But maybe I misunderstood. Maybe it was the goal to exactly copy the, the, the features of, of, of Adobe. Well, I'm not copying features. It's just that uh, NYPR one of the engineers there likes to use Adobe Edition, and when he wants to know the frequency of a tone, he just opens the program and sees what the frequency module indicates. I, I was just using that as a point of comparison Understood. when I was uh, calculating the, uh, the um, values myself. And also FFmpeg produces similar results as Adobe Edition. These are, these are just formulas and objective ways of analyzing sound. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Great, let's give Aida another round of applause.